I'm Sarah Miller McKeon, the founder of Sage Publishing, and I am pleased to welcome today Professor and Dr. Jennifer Richardson of Yale University, who is being honored today with the Sage Casbus Award for her wonderful work in social psychology and we're going to talk about that now. So, thank you so much, Sarah. I was wondering, Jen, do you prefer Jen or Jen? Jen is fine, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what drew you to, as an undergraduate at Brown and then, in, and then into social psychology as you continued your studies at Harvard for a PhD. Yeah, oh, wow, taking, taking me back. Yeah. I mean, social psych is one of my favorite fields. Yes, so. yes mine too. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, it's, it's, it's actually an interesting and not a straightforward st um, story. And I tell my students this all the time because they're all thinking they need to know exactly what they want to do, you know, when they start college. But um, I definitely didn't think about um, social psychology. I didn't know what social psychology was. <laughs> I was actually a pre-med and uh, neuroscience minor at the time. They didn't have a neuroscience major. Um, but I really cared about identity, <laughs> uh, intergroup relations, racism, sexism, um, inequality broadly in society. And so all of my extracurricular activities, well, not all of them, but many of them <laughs> in college had to do with these questions of how do we make our country, our society, our world more peaceful, more just, more equitable. And I didn't realize until quite late in the game, actually, not until my junior year, um, when I took a class in the ed school, not in, in the education department, not in the psychology department, called the psychology of race, class, and gender. And I had that, you know, Oprah aha moment <laughs> that said, wait a minute, wait, you can study these topics, you know, that that's a science. <laughs> There's a field, a discipline that, you know, works on these issues. And it just really changed everything for me. In fact, that wonderful professor, uh, Fanny's Miller is her name. Um, she was also the first black female professor I had at uh, Brown and just really in every way stood for what was possible for me and, in, and changed the trajectory of my career. So I just got hooked on it and she said, well, you can study these topics in counseling psych, clinical psych or social psych. And by that point I decided pre-med was not for me. Uh, well, medicine wasn't for me because I really didn't like blood and <laughs> sick, <laughs> sick people, <laughs> sickness. Um, and so counseling and clinical sound, it's still a little bit too close to that. <laughs> so I said, well, let me look into the social psych thing. And, um, and you know, the rest is history, literally. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting yes. to know. <laughs> um, so could you talk a little more about being a young woman of color and how that uh, affected your experience and your trajectory? And how do you think that varied from the experience of fellow students, um, both those who looked like you and those who didn't? Yes, yeah. I mean, you know, I have such, an, I think I had a, such an interesting set of experiences because I'm a, you know, well, at the time, young <laughs> black woman. Um, I'm from Baltimore. Uh, I had gone to a predominantly black, all-female high school, public school, uh, in Baltimore, Western High School. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was extraordinary. Again, affirming every part of my identity. Um, certainly, you know, I, be I believe fully in the promise and the power of a um, women's schools, uh, high school and even college, because, you know, you really, I had this, the great opportunity to, you know, be in a space where women and girls ran everything, right? We were in charge of student government, in charge of all the clubs, in charge of the band, and, you know, and it was just a moment, you know, those four years where, you know, you, I mean, so formative that 
exiting it, we all, and I still am close to many of my classmates, we all left knowing that we could do anything as women. There were not limits you know, that, for, on us. And so going into college, of course, I went to Brown. It's very different, <laughs> not predominantly black, not all female. <laughs> um, I got exposed to levels of wealth I had never even knew existed, right? I mean, I, I found out that people summer, <laughs> that that was a verb to summer. <laughs> and, um, and that was, you know, new and exciting and terrifying in some ways. But, you know, I was fortified by that experience in high school and, you know, knew that, okay, this is new, this is a, this is a challenge, but surely I, uh, I can rise to it, you know, surely, uh, my preparation, even at a Baltimore City public school, um, is is sufficient. If not, um, you know, I mean, it prepared me quite well, actually, um, uh, for for my time at Brown. And and I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was, it um, it was great. But it did allow me to see, you know, how. I might operate at a place like Brown, you know, as one of few students of color that in ways that are different than, you know, some of my, you know, white classmates, right? I mean, I was in big lecture classes and the professor would know if I was not there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the same for everyone, right? Um, and again, it really um, reinforced my determination to learn about the experience of being one of few pick a category in a space that's dominated by you know some other um, and it really actually made me want to understand the commonalities that people have across different types of social identities we call them or you know groupings um, and to see how we could bridge them right I mean that's really where my um, interest in understanding how we, how we think about ourselves, but also how we can bridge and reach out to other people. That really fundamentally began uh, at Brown and of course was nurtured at Brown. Right, that's very useful to know. I, I was wondering, um, many undergraduates assume that their careers will have impact and yours certainly has, but um, as this, you know, award and the many others that you've received so far uh, attest. But how has your life after graduation stacked up to your expectations when you were in college? Oh, wow. Um, I couldn't have imagined this, any of this, quite honestly. I didn't. You know, I, I obviously expected to go to college. I expected to graduate. <laughs> I expected to you know, get a job somewhere, probably I would come back home to Maryland. You know, I wasn't thinking of myself as going into the academy at all. It wasn't something that was an obvious next step. No one in my family um, at the time had a PhD and certainly we weren't college professors. Um, and again, that one class changed my trajectory. And so I went to graduate school and then um, got my PhD. And honestly, I expected, I expected, but part of me thought, okay, I will get this training and use it maybe at a nonprofit, helping them do their good works better with some evidence base. You know, again, thinking that social psychology is for doing the work to make society better. And honestly, it's, you know, that moment where I applied for faculty jobs and, you know, got a couple offers and I said, you know, I have an opportunity to be someone else's Fanny's Miller. You know, I have an opportunity to be in that room as a professor teaching this content and maybe inspiring somebody like me who hadn't even thought about becoming a professor to do it. I should give it a go. And that's really why I took the, a job in, as a, a professor. I mean, I love doing my research. I mean, I, you know, I actually really like teaching. Um, but I said I just owe it, I almost you know, paying it forward in some way. And I figured if I didn't get tenure, didn't work out, that's okay. I could get another job. I'll be fine. <laughs> and it's just kind of worked out. <laughs> very, very interesting. Um, because I, I hadn't thought of it that way. I, I had a, I guess, y you've worked so long and hard at connecting social and behavioral science 
and public policy, um, which has always mm -hmm. been, you know, at the core of my That's heart. That's right. And I was wondering what led you to ignore the notion held by many academics um, to, to be a scholar, which you've just explained, rather than working in, say, government or public policy making mm -hmm. or business. Never even thought of you as thinking about the nonprofit world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's, so now you've, uh, you've opened up a whole <laughs> other series of questions that I haven't thought about that's asking right. you about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you know so I um, yeah I, I really it's I mean it is, it is a great question and I do sometimes think okay in my next act I will do it at a policy school or in maybe some more direct public um, service way um, that's partly why I agreed to serve on you know. Biden Harris's uh, PCAST um, to get a little bit of that, do a little bit of that work. But I, uh, every time I'm in the position to think about that kind of move, especially into a policy school, because I do have those types of offers from time to time, you know, I really, um, it, it, it becomes clear to me that I'm not quite ready to walk away from undergraduate teaching and mentoring. I mean, there, and, and graduate teaching and mentoring. I mean, really um, standing for what's possible, mentoring young students of color, especially women, uh, women scientists, women of color, you know, through really showing them how to be this, <laughs> to do this if they want to, you know, has been the part of the the best, one of the best components, you know, I mean, you know, it doesn't get you fanfare or awards, although I did win a mentoring award. <laughs> Thank you, students. But, you know, it's just, it's just really wonderful, right? I mean, you, re you just get such um, the, the value of what you do in shaping the lives and careers of, of young people is just something that is hard to, um, walk away from and you know well I should be clear my mom was a teacher <laughs> and then I spent a principal uh, and superintendent my grandmother was a teacher for some number of years so maybe that I have that bug in me I, I suppose um, but I really love working with I mean again with the undergrads and with the grad students and we do have a problem of diversity in academia and including my field. And, you know, again, I feel like part of my job, my responsibility is to, you know, not just open doors, but to help people through them. And, and you know, like I can't really do that anywhere else besides mm -hmm. in, in the academy, so. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. But a good deal of my students, actually, my graduate students, go on to work in nonprofits <laughs> or do other things, which I'm really proud of. I'm not mm -hmm. one that says if you don't go into academia, then you somehow like, failed no. or you're less than. I'm like, no, this is wonderful. Or, you know, walk your path and you have the tools to do it and, yeah, go change the world. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, drawing from your own work, what do you encourage people at all levels in American higher education um, to understand, to learn, and possibly to adopt from your work? Oh, wow, that's, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the, maybe the, the number one, not number one, a lesson is to really Let's play. <laughs> there, there's so many um, things that I, 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 part of my answer to this is what I wish I had known before I, st well, before I discovered it. <laughs> so part of it is um, yeah, being unafraid to be vulnerable in the face of uncertainty. So uncertainty because a room, a uh, um, whether it be at a classroom or a space that you enter into is very diverse in a way that you're not used to. You know, don't sit in that discomfort and recognize that on the other side of it, other side of it is something potentially remarkable. There's something to learn. There's a way that you will grow um, that you'll value 
on the other side, but it's challenging <laughs> when you're going through it. It's challenging when all of a sudden you might not understand the norms of the space or um, the languages that are being spoken or you know any number of, of um, features of the, of the room, um, the people in the room and how they're doing their business. And that could be a disciplinary divide. Obviously, it's true of many cultural divides. Um, it's, it's true more than we, it could be true more than we were willing to admit, except for we're used to maintaining ourselves, limiting ourselves <laughs> to engaging in spaces that, are mo that we're most comfortable in. And we do that more and more, I think, as we get older, actually. <laughs> Young people, are often willing to thrust themselves into into environments where they don't know anything about you know what's going on and you know do so with an open heart um, and and learn and grow from it and you know I think that's a that's a lesson for all of us and certainly my research suggests that it is one pathway to fostering more cohesive yet diverse spaces effectively. So when you look over your body of work, um, and when I look at it, and I've been particularly impressed by some of the things I've recently read, uh, papers of mm -hmm. yours that had to do with um, the differences in equality, particularly economic equality, you know, the kinds of gaps in pay. Yes. <laughs> Um, where I've always been aware that women get paid less mm -hmm. for the same job than men do. But I've not been as aware as you have made mm -hmm. me of the huge gaps that mm -hmm. white people still think, ex you know, um, have been closed, mm -hmm. that are still there between what black people get in the same jobs as white people. Yes. <laughs> And um, I'm not sure if that should make me, you know, when I look at your work, um, more optimistic about the future or more pessimistic. Where do you fall <laughs> when yes. you think about it? You know, I, I, um, I, it's funny, that's one of the questions that social scientists would say, you should probably ask somebody else whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic. <laughs> because I'm going to solidly defend my um, realism. How about that? Okay. I, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I fall in a place where we cannot do anything about these immense gaps, especially on wealth, but also any number of economic, um, other economic indicators, you know, between what the average or median white family has and the median black family and Latino family, to be um, clear, if we don't acknowledge them. And I think many of us, I, I have been shocked. <laughs> I, I don't remember when I first learned what the, the black-white wealth gap was, um, but I was shocked, whatever that was. <laughs> and then I became um, shocked anew when it was clear to me that my students didn't know what it was. And honestly, that entire body of research that we've been doing, and I'll talk about it a little bit later today, was born of the you know, shock of other people. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so, the, so I, I'm not, people don't know this, right? And so our first set of studies were to demonstrate how unaware we are um, as Americans about something that's fundamental to our nation and you know while at the same time most Americans really do believe in egalitarianism we really do want to live and um, contribute to and participate in a country that is fair equitable and just and in the you know the distance between those two beliefs <laughs> right is um, is wide and so you know what can we do as social scientists, especially as psychologists, to you know, peel away, I guess, the layers of denial, <laughs> um, you know, 
some of it motivated uh, to really make us first face and then come to terms with what is so in order to change it, to mm -hmm. do what we can to, to make our country into the one that we think it is. And what it should be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to warn you that when you get this award, it's heavy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, take a try and remember not to drop it. Okay, thank you and so much. And it will come along with the check. Thank you. And with my deepest regard for you. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm truly honored to receive this incredibly prestigious prize. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.